heard about PCR biosystems? There's quite a buzz about us. Hop on over to our website to find out more. and welcome to this Pint of Science event, How COVID-19 Outsmarts Our Immune System. In just one short hour, there will be a lot of learning about how a tiny virus manages to invade our bodies in such an effective way. Now, I'm sad we can't be in an actual pub for this Pint of Science, but I do hope everyone is comfy at home with their pints in hand. Cheers. Um, my name is Zoe. I'll be your host for this evening. Um, I work in the fundraising team at the Francis Crick Institute, the largest biomedical research institute in Europe under one roof. Now, the Crick is full of scientists working to understand the fundamental biology underlying human health and disease. But full disclaimer, I am not one of those scientists. I have spent several years, however, at the Crick, surrounded by the 1200 scientists, and I am definitely interested. So I'm here to ask any uh, silly questions in case one of our scientists joining us this evening says something a little bit too mind-blowing. Um, but the general theme of this evening is a war that rages on in our bodies between our immune system and, in this case, COVID-19. We're going to learn about what kind of armies we have in our bodies and then the weapons and even the camouflage that the virus uses to try and invade. Now, you could say that our speakers this evening have discovered some very important intelligence into the coronavirus operation, and each of our speakers will give a short presentation on their work. There'll be lots of time for questions after each talk, and then we'll have a big Q&A session at the end of all the presentations. So if you have any questions or comments, leave them in the chat box next to the stream if you're watching live, and please do join in this conversation. Now to our first speaker, Leon, a Crick scientist who has been given quite the mammoth task to describe how the immune system works in just 10 short minutes. So Leon, please do tell us about these tiny little troops. Yes, thank you, Sorry, That's, uh, yeah, it's quite a challenge to try to present the whole immune system in 15 minutes. So I've condensed a little bit and I'm talking to you about uh, why T cells move to protect you. So basically, I'm going to tell you how T cells move around your body to defend you against illnesses. T cells are my favorite cells and they move around a lot. And today I'm going to explain to you how and why they do that. What you can see here are some T cells that I took some pictures of under a microscope and they're traveling around the world. But we're going to get to the world analogy a little bit later. First, though, I'm going to talk to you about what the immune system is. And basically, very simple terms, uh, the immune system is the body's safeguard against infection and disease. It's basically like tiny little police detectives that are constantly searching around for signs of invaders. And basically, the immune system is a very complex web of millions of police officers or immune cells that all interact with each other. And this coordinates the body's, these cells coordinate the body's immune uh, defense cells. And when they coordinate and act together, that's called the immune response. And basically, the immune system prevents even small infections like a cold or a paper cut from getting out of hand. And there's a lot of different types of immune cells out there that fight infections. And one of those types of cells are T cells, which I'm going to talk to you about now. So first and foremost, what are T cells and what do they do? Well, T cells are very specialized immune cells. And broadly, uh, the most common types of T cells can be divided into two main categories. The first category is the killer T cells which as our name suggests, are able to kill cells. These can be either your own cells that are infected by viruses or cells that have turned cancerous. The second category of T cells are the helper T cells. And helper T cells have a very different role. These cells turn on other immune cells. So for example, they can turn on killer T cells, but they can also turn on other immune cells. So for example, from all the news about COVID, I'm sure you've heard about antibodies. T cells also help here, where they turn on B cells that produce antibodies. And aside from these, they turn on many, many other cell types, either directly or through alarm signals that they can send out. 
And basically, these helper T cells coordinate the immune response. So helper T cells also play a very important role in preventing the immune system from attacking your own body. So they can turn off the immune system when the infection they're fighting is over, or they can turn off immune cells that wrongly attack your own cells. So my PhD is on helper T cells. And so I'm studying how these cells move. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how they move and why they move. So what are T cells looking for? Well, basically in the body, T cells are always looking for signs of invaders, and they do this to help start the immune response. And to help them in this hunt, T cells rely on special immune cells that live all over your body. These special immune cells live in barriers to the outside world, like the skin, for example. And when an invader uh, enters your body through the barrier, so these are little invaders here, these cells chase them down and eat them up. These cells then digest the invaders and break them down into little pieces. And the little pieces of invader are called antigen. And it's this antigen that T cells are specifically looking for. So finding an antigen tells T cells that they need to activate and then in turn, turn on other immune cells. And to help the T cells find the antigen to match up with, the special immune cells display them on the outside of the cell on a hand-like molecule. And because these cells present antigen, yes, I'm sorry, animation here, is that the little antigen is moving to the hand and is being displayed on the cell. And because these cells present antigen, they're called antigen presenting cells. And in your body, there's basically around 300 billion different T cells. And each T cell has a unique hand, as you can see here, that is specific for a unique antigen. And each T cell's mission in life is to find their own unique antigen presented on the special hand of the antigen presenting cell. And it can only detect antigen that's presented on this antigen presenting cell here. So T cells can be very specific for antigen that you, for example, may have never encountered before. So you had T cells that could recognize parts of the virus that causes COVID before COVID even existed, which is to me a crazy idea. Uh, to detect these antigen, T cells make a special handshake with the cells that display the antigen. So basically this hand has to match up with this hand and the antigen together to basically make a handshake that uh, basically switches on the T cell and then activates it. So these guys, clearly this hand does not match up with this one, nor does this one. So they're wrong, but this hand and this antigen do match up. And so basically when the T cell matches up and they have a handshake that matches, the T cell becomes activated and its mission is accomplished. So basically helper T cells move around to find their specific antigen as presented by antigen presenting cells. So why do T cells move around so much? Well, basically T cells need to guard the body and look for these invader specific antigen displayed on these antigen presenting cells. So as you can imagine, if you've got 300 billion T cells all looking for one specific piece of antigen, it's gonna involve a lot of hunting around. So in fact, if you were to take all the T cells in your body and let them move around for 15 minutes and you were to measure that, they would travel the equivalent distance of the world's equator, which is insane to think about how these tiny, tiny little cells that you need a high power microscope to see all together can travel, you know, miles, miles, miles. Yeah, but you can imagine that basically the combination of the right cell, finding the right antigen presenting cell is super rare. Uh, so to help them make the right combination, T cells continuously move around the bloodstream, organs like the skin, and to the specialist immune hotspots called lymph nodes. And these crossroads, immune crossroads, they are spread out all over your body. And so for example, if you've got a cold, you might feel your lymph nodes in your neck have swollen up. That's basically your immune system in action. Uh, after antigen presenting cells eat an invader, uh, these antigen presenting cells also move to lymph nodes. So basically this increases the chance of T cells matching up with the antigen presenting cells. Once the antigen presenting cells actually meet up in the lymph node, they start to release all sorts of molecules that attract T cells to come to them. And this helps the search process. So one antigen presenting cell can contact up to 1000 T cells per hour which is a crazy thought again, a lot of cells all meeting up with this antigen presenting cell, trying to find the right combination of handshake. So when the immune cell and the antigen cell meet, antigen presenting cell meet, they can basically have a handshake and then activate the T cell. So in summary, T cells are moving around constantly looking for their specific antigen presenting cell hand combination. So how do T cells exit the bloodstream? I was telling you before that T cells move around between the organs and the lymph nodes. And so to do that, they use the bloodstream to travel around and they need to then exit that. So when invaders such as bacteria here, 
uh, are detected by immune cells that live in, for example, the gut, um, detect these invaders, they basically sound the alarm. And this alarm bell basically causes a process called inflammation, which is something that you might have heard about before. Inflammation basically consists of small molecules that turn on other cells. And it's actually very important in starting the immune response. And what's actually really interesting is that each organ has its own postcode. So basically, if there's an infection in the intestine, for example, it increases the amount of postcode molecules along the bloodstream. And as I mentioned before, T cells normally travel around in the blood. Uh, what I didn't say before is that each T cell has its own preference for the specific organs that they like to go to. So um, basically to help them decide where to go, T cells have little protein postcode detectors on them that kind of look a little bit like lollipops. And these postcode detectors are specific for the organ that they want to go to. So you can see there's a little circle here. It's going to match up with the postcode of the intestine, which is a little uh, hole into which a circle fits. Basically, uh, these lollipops and the postcode molecules, they kind of act like Velcro. So when the T cell flows along in the blood, the lollipop proteins catch onto the postcode molecules, and this basically helps the T cells crawl through and enter the organ that they want to go to. This is partially guided again by the uh, alarm molecules, these inflammation molecules, and that's basically then altogether helps fight the invader. So why is it important that we study this? Why do we care about this? Well, essentially what we want to do is we want to try to speak the language of T cells to try to understand how and why they move. So T cells perform many tasks in the immune system, and sometimes these tasks can go wrong. So for example, T cells can attack the body itself, or they can overreact, causing too much inflammation in the wrong place. We don't really understand how all these things work together, especially in the context of cell movement. So what can we do with this knowledge? Well, if we can speak the language of T cells, we can tell T cells where to go to help us. So for example, the T cells in my partner, uh, they went rogue and they started to attack her gut. Uh, and this is an autoimmune disease called Crohn's disease, which is basically where there's a lot of inflammation in the gut. And thanks to the understanding of how they move, there's a newly developed medicine that uses the knowledge of how T cells get into the gut. So basically the medicine blocks the lollipops that help the T cells cross into the gut and therefore stops the T cells from entering the gut. This basically prevents the T cells from sounding the alarm bell, but only in the gut. So we don't need to actually shut down the whole immune system. We can just stop T cells from going to specific places. And another thing that we might be able to do is that in the future, we can send T cells to, uh, for example, cancer tumors. So currently, if somebody's got cancer, what we're able to do is we can take out immune cells from the tumor and grow them out in a dish. And we can then infuse those back into the body. The problem is that uh, you know, we can put them back, but those T cells that we put back don't really know where to go. So how can we help those T cells go to the right place? Well, if we can speak the language of T cells, we can tell them where to go to fight the cancer, for example. And one way that this could be done potentially is uh, I read in a recent paper that they engineer T cells to have a special detector on them that is sensitive to light. So when light shines, T cells are attracted to it to move towards it. So basically this will allow us to tell T cells where to go and they will understand to go to that specific place. Now, this is still in the early stages, so this is not something that's being applied in the clinic at all yet, but maybe in the future, we can use this technology to help people. So what you can see here is T cells in a dish. And basically here is a little light source. And what you're gonna see is that some of those T cells are gonna be attracted to that light source. We're gonna point those T cells out with little red arrows. So you can see that T cell there and there. They're gonna move towards that light. And as soon as they reach the light, they're gonna hang out there. So imagine if underneath that light, there's a cancer or there's a bacterial infection or something else, we can then steer T cells towards it and then hopefully make uh, cure the cancer or clear the infection. So in summary, this was a whirlwind tour of how and why T cells move around. But a few messages I want you to take home is that little chopped up bits of invaders are called antigen. Antigen are displayed by antigen presenting cells. T cells are looking for their own unique antigen hand combination. T cells move around a lot. And with the knowledge on how T cells move, we can create new therapies and improve lives. Thanks, Leon. Um, just wow, that was whistle stop, but really, I mean, there was, it astounds me how much is going on when you don't actually notice it.
The other thing Absolutely. that I'm a little bit jealous about is the idea that like T cells and the antigen presenting cells, they're allowed to shake hands, but we're not. That's not fair. Um, but we've had a few questions about some bits of your talk from the audience. So firstly, um, how can the body know about diseases before they exist or the body has ever encountered them? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it's actually, uh, it's got to do with the way that your DNA, uh, but basically there's this, there's this event in the development of T cells where little bits of DNA inside the developing T cells are being shuffled around. And this basically uh, creates these hand molecules that are different for each T cell because the little bits of DNA are all connected in different ways. And so each T cell has a unique hand as a result of that. And basically your body selects for T cells that are all different and that don't react with antigen that looks like something in your own body. So that would cause an autoimmune re uh, disease, which we don't want, of course. So your body's actually killing those T cells that are developing with little hands that detect molecules that look like your body's. Again, just mind blowing. It's fascinating. Um, it really is. Um, we've got another question from the audience. Uh, uh, I wonder why lymph nodes swell up. Does that have anything to do with T cells? Yeah, so that's a really good question. Uh, so actually, lymph nodes swell up. So I was mentioning before that these antigen presenting cells, they move towards the lymph nodes to help them sort of contact as many T cells as possible. And when these immune cells, these antigen presenting cells are in the lymph node, they release all sorts of inflammation molecules, which attracts a lot of T cells to come to it. And it's literally those T cells packing in and other immune cells packing into those lymph nodes that causes them to swell up. So there's just not enough space. No, it's like being space. stuck on the tube. Um, well, thanks so much for that, Leon. Um, you really set the scene telling us about our body's defensive strategy. And um, now we're gonna move on to our next speaker, Crick researcher, Anthony, who's been working to understand what weapons the coronavirus uses in order to launch a successful attack on our body. So over to you, Anthony. Thank you, Zoe, and cheers to organizers for making it possible despite the pandemic. So what I would like to tell you about today is the pathogen that causes the pandemic, which is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And the small molecular machine on the surface of this virus, known as a spike protein, and how do we study it in the creek? And what studies about it can tell us about the biology of the virus and things like new emerging variants, antibody responses, vaccines, etc. So let's start from the very beginning, which is what is a virus? A virus is a small machine, so it's a small being which is not alive, but which reproduces. But in order to reproduce, what it needs to do first is it needs to infect some other se some cell. So this cell we call the host cell, and the host cell can be a human cell, it can be an animal cell, it can be even a bacterium. But in case of the coronavirus, this is a human cell. So the way the virus infects it is it uses these spike proteins on its surface so here we have a virus molecule, and here we have the host cell, so the animal cell, let's say. And the way the virus infects it is it first binds the host cell using the spike proteins on the surface of the virus, joining it to the host cells via these small molecules called receptor molecules. So what we'll try to talk about today is how do we study these spike proteins on the surface of the coronaviruses, how do these spike work, and what studying spike can tell us about the pandemic. So let's start at the beginning, so how do we study spike? So we use electron microscopy to study spike because we are structural biologists, and the way we do it is we basically look at them under the electron microscope. So you might remember from school that you'd look at things under the microscope by basically putting them on this small glass slide so for example you take a drop of a pond water you'd put it here on the glass slide insert it in the microscope and look at it so we do very similar thing here with the with electron microscopy but instead of a glass slide we use this small copper grid on which we put a small amount of the spike solution and then we freeze it so in order to freeze it we use this machine called the vitrobot we freeze it in liquid ethane 
And what it allows us to do is it forms a very thin layer of ice that we call vitreous ice. Vitreous, because it doesn't have any form, it looks like glass, it's transparent, so by lighting a beam of electrons through it, we can basically see the particles of spike in this ice. So in order to do it, we insert the, this grid with frozen spike on it into the microscope. So here on the left is a small microscope, 120,000 volts. On the right is a large microscope that we have in the basement in the creek, 300,000. And with two people who did all the work that I'm, or most of the work that I'll be telling about to you today, which is Donald Benton, my friend and colleague, and myself. So we put these spikes into the microscope, and then what we see is this. So as you see, it's not the most informative picture, but I know because I've seen very many of them that these small things here are spikes. But in order to see them better, we take very many thousands of such pictures, and then we take thousands of these small pieces of picture and we put them together and average them. And from this, we get these images called 2D averages, which we can then compute to obtain this, which is a 3D molecular structure. So it is a 3D structure. So here I have a 3D model as well. Yeah, so the spikes are 3D molecules, as any molecules, and I will tell you more about it in a second. So now we establish how do we study spike, but how does spike work? So when we looked at it the first time, we and other researchers, basically what we've seen is that the spike does not adopt only this one form that we call conformation, but it can basically erect this small bit of it, which I have here erected, or erect, which is called the receptor binding domain. And only when it does so, it can bind to the receptor. So here I have a receptor molecule, and you can see that it fits here very nicely. And here I have two already bound on it, but I can't bind it to this one because there's nothing pointing out from it. So we know from our studies that spikes can exist in these two states, and then by mixing it with the receptors, we could look at the cycle of it binding to the receptor. So here we see how spike opens each domain at once and bind to one, two, three, and that's the third molecule of the receptor. And while it does so, you will also see in a second that it exposes its inside. And what this inside does is it allows the spike to then fuse the membrane of the virus with the membrane of the host, which then allows it to enter the host cell. So here, let's go back to this image that I showed you at the beginning. So now you understand that on the left, there is, this is the surface of the virus with spike molecules embedded in it binding to the receptors on the host cell. And you can see they can bind one, two, three. And then at the end, what happens is that it fuses and it joins this virus membrane with the host cell. So that's how the spike works. But what studying it can tell us about the pandemic. So I will focus about one particular thing today, which is how studying it can tell us something about the emergence of new variants. So when we the first time we studied it, so we looked at the strain of the virus that came from the Wuhan, so the original early pandemic virus. And when we studied the spike protein from it, we observed that most of these molecules of spike were in the closed conformation. So closed is a conformation that, as I said, doesn't bind the receptor. But then another variant spike emerged called D614G, or simply G614, which became dominant. And if something becomes dominant, one can think that it might have become dominant because it's better in doing what it does, which in case of the virus is infecting the cells. So we wanted to look at the spike from this, var from this variant and compare it with the original one and see whether there are any differences. And indeed, when we solved the structure of this new spike, G614 spike, we observed that most of it is in either one erect RBD or two RBD erect forms, which both are capable of binding the receptor, which means that the virus evolved into this new variant for it to better bind to the receptor. 
Now we're studying the same phenomenon on the UK variants, South African variants, and many other variants in order to try to uh, understand what's going on, but we think that it's basically the same process repeating. The other things that can that we can find out from studying uh, spike is, for example, where the antibodies on the spike bind. So here is a work from another group from the Creek, George Cassiotti's group, in which they map some very interesting antibodies on the surface of the spike. Here is some other other work on the spike binding to antibodies. We also study spikes from different coronaviruses from animals, trying to understand the emergence of the pandemic. So trying to understand the bat or pangolin spikes and many other things. So I hope I managed to explain today how do we study spike? We use electron microscopy for it. How does it work? It basically opens and then it binds to one, two, up to three receptors, exposing its fusogenic machinery inside. And what studying it can tell us about the pandemic, for example, can tell us a lot about the emergence of new variants. So I would like to acknowledge all these people on the left, people involved in the science, and on the right, organizers of, pin, of the pint of science, especially uh, Steph, who was extremely great with getting us together, and our making labs, the people who made these lovely models for us, the engineers in the creek, especially Christina. And thank you very much for listening, and please ask questions. Well, thank you, Anthony, for, I mean, not only teaching us about the spike protein, but also actually bringing your model with you. Um, speaking of uh, the 3D models, a question from the audience. Um, wondering if the mutations in the spike protein appear distinctive on a 3D model. Uh, so it, it's a bit too small to show the mutation on it, but what we can show is, for example, yeah, I don't have a, such a model, but basically what, so this is the dominant uh, model of the dominant Wuhan spike, whereas the dominant, the 614, would have these domains more open. So yes, we can see the effect of it, but we can't see the single substitution that led to it, so the, chain, the single change of amino acids, because the models are a, a bit too small for this. I mean, they're still pretty spectacular. Um, another question from the audience. Do other viruses like HIV also have spike proteins? They do have proteins that are similar to spike proteins. So in case of HIV, it's called an envelope glycoprotein. And yes, so most of the viruses that have envelopes, so-called, so membranes, they would have similar proteins like a spike protein that would bind to the receptor and then allow the virus to fuse with the host membrane. So in case of HIV, this is the envelope protein, so called GP120 and 41 in terms of Influenza, this is hemagglutinin. But yeah, there are, yes, it's the short answer. I mean, it's a short answer that came with a lot of code words that I don't understand, but I'm glad someone Sorry. does. That's very useful. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, Anthony, um, and also to Anthony's giant microscope. Um, so we've learned about the body's army, we've learned about the weapons that the coronavirus uses. But now Crick researcher Anna Chiara is here to explain how the virus essentially camouflages itself in order to hide from our immune system. So thank you, Anna Chiara. Thank you very much, Zoe. I thank you everyone for joining this show tonight. So today I'm going to tell you a story of a green virus. So Leon has showed you how uh, our immune system constantly scans for enemies in our body. And Anthony, has showed you the weapon that SARS-CoV-2 uses, the, the actual spike protein, to attack our cells, our, our cells and also the tools that we use to study the spike protein, like the giant electron microscope. So today I want to show you how a very smart strategy uh, that SARS-CoV-2 puts in place to uh, evade our immune system. So a very um, common trick that viruses in general use to uh, shield themselves against the immune system is to cover their surface with sugars. You, you have to know that uh, our cells, the surface of our cells is covered by sugars and they create a proper shield on the surface of the viruses. 
Therefore, antibodies that are produced by our bodies, um, they work like darts. So they try to aim and target the virus with the laser precision. And having all these glycans, having all these sugars on the surface, just impede the antibodies to see the enemy. So this is a very smart technique of camouflage. But what is very peculiar about SARS-CoV-2 is this beautiful green color. So this story started when the pandemic started and I stopped working on HIV-1. And I started uh, producing bits of viral particles. So I was trying to produce different proteins of these um, virus in order to develop a test, a very sensitive test that could detect antibody from blood of patients uh, directed to this, this virus. So in this uptend, I was producing different bits of virus, but every time I was producing the spike, I used to see this beautiful green color. Maybe because green is my favorite color, I was just fascinated by this. And um, I really thought that this was telling us something. So together with my colleagues, we started investigating, first of all, why this, process, this protein was green, because this is a very unusual thing. And we found out that this virus behaves like a proper soldier. So, you know, when soldiers go to war, they wear their uniform, which is usually green, right? And this is exactly what this virus does. It wears a small green molecule that is present in our body. I know it sounds weird, but I'm pretty sure you all experience this. So every time you hit yourself, you get a bruise, right? And the color of this bruise is actually due to the accumulation of these pigments. For example, biliverdin confers a green color to your bruise. And the accumulation of biliverdin is a very important in the healing process of the bruise. So how does this small green molecule fit in, uh, in the spike? So what we did was to visualize the spike protein by using the giant microscope that Anthony has showed you. And we tried to map where this small molecule was bound. And we identified a small pocket in the spike where Billy Verne fits very nicely. And what really surprised us is, was that this molecule covers only 1% of the total surface of the spike. So the spike is actually huge. And this biliverdin is very, very small. But the position where biliverdin binds is extremely important because what we found out is that every time biliverdin was there, a portion between 30 and 50% of the antibodies that we produce is not able to see the virus. So you can imagine that the way we protect ourselves from the virus is by wearing a mask, right? And we cover a very small part of our body, but it's a very important part. Likewise, the virus masks itself to protect itself against the immune system. The next question we tried to address was, OK, we know biliverdin binds there. We know the virus becomes suddenly invisible to the immune system. But how does all these pieces fit in a COVID condition? So we might all know that lungs are the infection site of this virus. So when the virus arrives and infects the lungs, there are, with the progression of the disease, there are some sorts of events that actually create an increasing amount of believability in the infection site. For example, the, the virus is able to um, generate blood vessel damage and recruits, and there is a massive recruitment of cells from our immune system in the infection site. And all these events together create a massive av availability of this biliverdin. And our body produces biliverdin in the attempt to heal, to protect itself. But the virus is so smart that has learned to take advantage of this, of something that's good for us, but it's very good for the virus as well, because the virus uses at its own advantage. To help you understanding what's what, what is really going on in the spike, specifically in the region, in the very small region of the spike where biliverdin bites, 
I want to show this, this I want to show this uh, analogy. So you have to imagine that the portion of the spike that binds biliverdin is like a door. And when biliverdin is there, it works like a door chain. So the door can't really doesn't have much freedom of movement. But when biliverdin is removed from the pocket, then the door can open and the antibodies have access to the spike. To help you understand it from a structural point of view, engineers at the Crick have, have printed for us a, a small uh, 3D model. This is just the region of the spike that binds biliverdin. And this is biliverdin green, of course. So when, and there is this kind of hole here, which is where biliverdin fits very, very nicely. And when biliverdin fits in there, all the structure is locked. So you don't have much movement in the structure of the protein. If you remove biliverdin from the spike, then you have all these tiny movements that can actually help our immune system to see the virus because the antibodies, and here we have a small uh, portion of, the, of an antibody, can see the target and can bind. So to summarize briefly, this virus, um, uses its spike protein to bind a small green molecule produced in our body and in this way hides itself from the immune system. Uh, there will be no story without all the people mentioned in this slide who helped build up this story. And I would not have been able to tell you this story without a uh, pint of science. So thank you for your, to the organizers and thank you for listening because there will be no story without an audience. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Annika. Um, I have to say, like the, you, it really does explain how COVID-19 has outsmarted our immune system. And I'm glad mm -hmm. there's someone just as smart as you to figure that out for us. Um, a question from the audience. Um, so if biliverdin helps COVID, can we get rid of it or stop our body from producing it in order to fight COVID? So this is a very smart question, but it's not that easy because biliverdin is important for our body, for the healing process. So you can't really stop the body producing it because it's important. What you could do is to design a molecule that mimics biliverdin. So the virus thinks that is biliverdin and wears it. But in the end, you are ju it's just wearing like a t-shirt saying, I am the invader, I'm an invader, please kill me basically. So this is the strategy. So you have to be a bit smarter than the virus. So if we design a molecule that can mimic believability and the virus likes it, you can then allow the immune system to attack the virus. Yeah, that, I mean, that does sound quite complicated to try and do. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, I guess I have a question. So how did you end up isolating biliverdin in a tube? Like where were you isolating the spike protein from? Yeah, this is a, a very weird story because I know, so how I ended up, I was not working with lungs. I was not working with patients. I was actually working with a cell line that is known as X cells, which are kidney cells. But you have to imagine that there is a source of biliverdin in all the cells in our body. So you get biliverdin also out of mitochondria and peroxisome that are small organelles in the cells. So it's not only the, a lung problem, it's a problem of all the body. So in all, all the cells of our body, we have a source of biliverdin. So that's why, and I was producing a lot of spike that I could see the green with my eyes. That was the funny side of the discovery. I'm glad you spotted it. I <laughs> think green's your favorite color. If it had been a different color, maybe you wouldn't have seen it. Um, yeah. So thanks so much for teaching Thank us all you. about the yeah. um, I'm now going to bring back our other speakers, Leon and Anthony, as well. Um, we've had all kinds of presentations. You've really taken us on quite a journey. Um, and then we've had some questions through from the audience. Um, so when we get vaccinated, do, do our um, APCs, they're the, the you, Leon, you talked about them, the antigen presenting cells, I feel like I've learned something. Do they present the virus to our immune system when we get vaccinated? 
Yeah, so that's a very good question, actually. Yeah. And so that's basically the concept of vaccination is that you're trying to train your immune system to help detect these things when it actually encounters them in the wild, in real life. So basically you inject your whatever virus or uh, little mRNA molecules from the Pfizer vaccine, for example. And this basically makes your body um, infected with a sort of a fake coronavirus spike protein. And then your immune system detects that something is wrong. And so it learns from that uh, spike protein that this is what it needs to be looking out for. And that's why it takes a couple of days for your immune system to actually kick in and protect you from current, from COVID. It's because, you know, it's learning, quote unquote, it's trying to get all the T cells together, all the B cells to produce the antibodies, start the immune response and thereby protect you, teach the immune system. It remembers it for a future infection. So clever. <laughs> Thanks, Liam. Um, another question, can we predict the future of uh, mutations of the spike protein that would be beneficial to the virus and then develop a vaccine against these potential mutants? Um, Anthony, do you want to have a go with that one? I can have a go, but unfortunately... <laughs> a big question. Yeah, it's a very good question, yes, but unfortunately it's, the short answer is no, we can't. But we can... But what we can do is we can monitor them while they appear. So that's what, you know, the global surveillance of the new emerging strains is very important because we can then update quite quickly our vaccines with the new emerging strains. So it's definitely doable. It's to some extent what's happening with influenza all the time. And we can definitely do it because it's pretty easy to update the vaccines where we do need the constant surveillance of the new emerging variants. Yeah, pre kind of to predict, it's a very big molecule, so it'd be very hard to do it. So um, I guess just for me to follow on from that, how long would that take? Like how long did your, when, when you're modeling the spike protein, how long did that take? And then I'm assuming it would take kind of that, would it take that long to do it with other? other so, we, so what we do is, so what we do is we actually use the real, yeah, we use real sequences of the viral protein, which means that it's an existing sequence. We use this to then look at the, to then make a protein, which is a real protein. But the problem with the variants is that we don't really know until we make a sequence of this new variant, we don't know what's in it. So to make all the possible sequences of all the variants, it's, it's probably impossible because it's, yeah, you have 20 amino acids and the protein is 1,200 or 1,300 residues, which would be then 1,300 to 20 possibilities of uh, every single variant, which probably is not going to happen. Okay, fair enough. We won't ask you to jump on that straight away then. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, another question, uh, is there an identified mechanism to how the virus removes biliverdin from the locked spike region when binding to a host cell receptor? Um, Anna Chiara, can you yeah. break that one down for us? So we don't know if there is a mechanism, but we have some hints, let's say, hints. So I know that this binding is sensitive to acidic condition. So if I treat my protein with acid, biliverdin gets released. So an hypothesis could be that the virus binds the cells and when it enters the cells, it gets incorporated into a small vesicle where there is a lot of acidic condition inside. So that is the point where Bilberti gets released. So it's like the virus needs the mask before it enters the cells and when it gets in, it removes it. But we don't have any like solid evidence that this is exactly the process. It's just an hypothesis and we would like to sort this out. So we are working on that basically. But this is a, a, cool, a cool way that the virus can um, infect the cells. So it wears the mask before it enters the cells and once it's in, it doesn't need the mask anymore. Yeah, that, that would make sense. It's already in there. Yeah. Um, and then another bill of adding question. Mm -hmm. um, does biliverdin help other viruses as well, or just SARS-CoV-2? Yeah, so this is pretty unique to SARS-CoV-2. 
Uh, we are now going to screen the emerging variants to see if this process is conserved in the, in the variants that are emerging at the moment. We checked uh, an extra virus, which is SARS-CoV-1, which is the closest relative to SARS-CoV-2. And, and it's responsible of the outbreak in 2003. And there is a bit of binding. It's not as tight as this virus, the novel coronavirus. But there is a bit. So it means that these two viruses, they share something in that spot. And that's why they are both able to bind very early. But the binding of SARS-CoV-2 is much stronger. And it's very unique to it. So I, I don't know any other virus able to do this. Really unique. No wonder it's so difficult to try and figure out. Yeah. Um, Got lots of questions coming from the audience. Um, so why is the original Wuhan strain spike protein mainly in a conformation where it is unable to bind the receptor protein? Uh, I think that one's for Anthony. It's a very good question and the answer is I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so this virus emerged probably through some zoonotic transmission as we call it. So basically there was some animal that got infected and then it jumped from this infected animal on humans. We don't yet quite know which animal was infected or any details about it. We know that these viruses normally infect bats, but yeah, that's basically what we know. Uh, so it's very, it's just not studied very well, but we are not quite sure what sort of receptors these viruses recognize in the animals. So they might use the same receptors for which they would need to open, yes, so they need to kind of move this domain. But it's also possible that for animals, they don't necessarily use the, re the same receptors, so they don't need to open. So we know in the case of SARS-CoV, which Kara just mentioned, yes, they do use the receptor and the open, but it's not necessarily true that in the bats they would need the same receptor. Yeah, we just don't know at this point. So it's possible that this so-called closed Confirmation is actually capable of binding some other receptors that we yet don't know about. And indeed, it is a case for some other coronaviruses that they bind using this domain rather than this one. And maybe when it got transmitted, it actually didn't need to bind to ACE2. And so it only now adapts to the human host by being more open and more capable of binding to the human receptors. So you said you didn't know, but you kind of know a little bit, which is still very impressive. I'm hypothesizing, <laughs> let's say, but yeah, I don't know. Is that Thanks, Anthony. Thank you. Um, another question, I think this one's for Leon. Um, are there any antigens that can't be recognized by our immune system? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I mean, I think, the main problem with detecting antigens is that you don't want to detect every antigen because you don't want your immune system to attack itself. So as I was saying before, there's a process uh, in T-cell development where the body basically kills T-cells that detect um, parts of your own body so that you don't get autoimmune diseases, which is not great. Um, apart from that, basically these antigens are basically little bits of chopped up proteins. So invaders, they are all like all bacteria and viruses. They basically all consist of proteins. Uh, so you want, so you need to have something that's based on proteins. So if you have, for example, a piece of plastic, that's not going to be detected by T cells. That's, that's harder to mount an immune response against. So in that respect, yeah, it needs to be some sort of organic molecule. Uh, then yes, T cells will be able to detect it probably. Okay. And then I guess kind of following on from that, do we know why COVID affects so many parts of the body? Who wants to have a go with that question? I can give a quick go, yeah. We know, so we, we know that it can bind, so these receptors that it binds, they actually are on multiple tissues, yes? So this ACE2 receptor, which I showed you this one, basically is on multiple tissues, and each tissue that it is, exposed on is basically vulnerable to the attack by the coronavirus. And when they attack, of course, then they multiply in these cells and then disrupt them to some extent. So then they can basically 
yeah, do harm in a given tissue if it's infected. We also know that there are alternative receptors other than ACE2, for example, in neuronal tissue, that some researchers from Bristol, for example, uh, discovered called neuropilin. And yeah, so depending on the receptors, the coronaviruses can bind to different tissues that have these receptors on the surface. I mean, that's, it's, it does really, I think it's crazy how smart this virus is. Um, and again, thank you all for, you know, taking the time to try and explain that. Um, one last question, I'm going to come around to each of you to ask it. Um, so aside from your research, so you've all started looking into the coronavirus, um, how else has COVID-19 affected your work at the CRIC? Um, let's start with Anna Chiara. Um, so I start from my research. So I said that I post my HIV project to start working on uh, COVID-19. And actually, it was one of the most rewarding and motivating experience I had in my career, because you can feel the impact of your research now. So it's not something that you discover, and then it takes 10 years to develop a drug or a treatment. It's something that is impacting the society now. So it really like boosts me up kind of and and also one lesson i learned it was to keep your eyes open so i just noticed the color in the end it was not like i'm sure many other scientists in the world have noticed the color of this protein but having this kind of gut feeling about what you do i think it can be the key for very important discoveries that's so lovely. Um, that's great. Uh, Anthony, same question. I can only second Chiara in what she said, basically, which is, yeah, so I, I used to work on influenza proteins. So again, so similarly to Chiara, I was pretty close to, to viral proteins. So it was quite easy for us to jump on, on the coronavirus research. But yes, again, it's quite, it's quite rewarding compared to the normal work we do, which then takes quite a while work on something which is so immediately impactful and yeah which can inform things like policies and and how the pandemic is actually tackled in the real time so it was yeah pure pleasure to work uh, very long hours on it <laughs> um, yeah i hope you're getting a break soon it's been a long year yeah. As indian it's variant has appeared so <laughs> oh no keeping you busy there's no rest Oh, no. <laughs> um, and Leon, what about you? Yeah, so unlike the other two, uh, I don't actually work on SARS-CoV-2 or COVID. Uh, so my research was really just sort of put on ice for the first lockdown, especially basically working from home, reading papers and trying to get started on my thesis. But yeah, during second and third lockdowns, I was lucky enough to be able to come into work to finish some last minute experience, experiments for my thesis. So. I was at that point one of the few people in the institute, which was yeah quite an interesting experience to be you know the only one working in your in your area, quite lonely at times, but uh, yeah, good to be able to finally get some stuff done. And uh, yeah, now I'm writing my thesis, so spending a lot of time working from home, as you can see in my lovely office. Great, good luck with that, Leon. And uh, you know, you're saying you're working alone in the creek. I think Anna Chiara is there right now. Yes. out of hours um, I just imagine you kind of running off once this is done putting your lab coat back on trying to save the world again um, but thank you to all of you to Anna Kiara, to Anthony and to Leon um, for taking the time out of your really busy schedules to explain to us all of all of your work it's been really really great um, and so I think we're pretty much out of time now uh, so thank you again I know if we were all together in person with a live audience. Everyone would be shouting cheers, raising their glasses. So cheers to you all. Um, and thanks to the audience for listening in. Um, I know I learned a, a lot and I hope you all did too. Um, there's gonna be a very uh, quick survey that's gonna pop up in the chat to those of you uh, listening at home. And if you do have any time, please take a couple of minutes just to let us know what you thought about the event, how great all the speakers were. Um, and if you liked what you heard and you want to hear even more about the Francis Crick Institute, where these three guys and myself spend most of our time, um, you can sign up to the Crick's newsletters um, on our website. 
uh, and we do put on other events outside of Pint of Science if you want to meet more researchers. So thanks again to everyone for Thank joining you. us. Thanks to the organisers for organising. Thanks to the audience for coming in. And I hope everyone has a really lovely evening. Thank you and good night. Thank, Thank you. you.